Uh, good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 16th meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off any mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. Uh, no apologies have been received for this meeting. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Is the committee agreed uh, to take agenda item four, consideration of evidence for the Scottish Housing Regulator session and agenda item five, consideration of the committee's future work programme in private? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is Scottish Housing Regulator Annual Report 2013-14. Uh, the committee will now take oral evidence from the Scottish Housing Regulator. Can I welcome Kay Blair, uh, Chair, and Michael Cameron, Chief Executive of the Scottish Housing Regulator. And can I invite Kay Blair to make an opening statement? Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to again present our work to the committee. Um, as I've said before, we very much welcome the committee's interest in and scrutiny of our work. We are, and I do believe, and I say it often enough, um, we are a listening and a learning organisation, and we're very keen to hear the views of our various stakeholders, and wherever possible, we do reflect these views in how we regulate. I'm delighted to be able today to report the progress we've made on the matters we set out in our letter of 5th of March. Michael and I will also answer any questions that you have on the progress update that we gave you in our written submission. Specifically, the committee asked us that we highlight progress around the introduction of an appeals pro process and on our work with the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, the SFHA, and about how we would agree its policy on entitlements, payments and benefits. So first of all, on appeals. We will go live with a new appeals process on the 1st of April 2016. We will work with all of our stakeholders, especially tenants, tenant organisations, landlords, their representative bodies, over the coming year to develop that process. We will aim to put in place an appeals mechanism that is transparent, that is accessible, that is proportionate, independent and cost-effective. We also need to ensure that it is able and that we are able to act swiftly where necessary to protect the interests of tenants and other service users, so other customers of social housing. On payments and benefits, I'm very pleased to report to the committee that we are now in a position as a regulator to endorse the SFHA's proposed model policy on entitlements, payments and benefits. This includes provisions on the limitation on the personal use by an RSL's governing body members and staff of its contractors, with appropriate flexibility in that code. This model policy takes account of the needs of landlords working in rural and remote communities. The SFHJ has issued the model policy to its members and it hopes to publish the final version later this week. We have proposed that in its workings with its members, it emphasises that individual landlords have the flexibility to opt out of parts of the model policy that they feel are particularly difficult to implement, given their particular circumstances, and that they can adopt different approaches, but of course still upholding the principles and spirit of the model policy and meeting our regulatory standards. We are happy to work with the SFHG around communicating and promoting its model policy. On other matters, we have had generally positive and constructive responses to our recent consultation on revised regulatory guidance, including that on notifiable events. Um, you may recall that we have always said from the beginning of our existence as an independent regulator that we would constantly review what we would do uh, and that we would, wherever possible, streamline our regulation. Um, we're currently reviewing 
the independent analysis of our regulatory guidance, uh, and we will publish this independent analysis along with our response and the final guidance later in the summer. As I said, it's been a very positive, helpful and constructive exercise. Finally, I would highlight that we're now into the second year of collecting charter information from, from landlords. The charter has been welcomed uh, by tenants particularly because of the information that it gives them and the ability it gives them to hold their landlord to account. In the second year, they will be able to look at the start of trend information to see how their <coughs> landlord is, is comparing um, not only with peers in the sector, but also over time. And I think that's really helpful. Also, on a high note, I'm delighted that our work in collecting the charter data and making it available to tenants and to other service users was recognised last week when we won two of the prestigious Holyrood Connect Awards, which celebrate public sector excellence in information and communications technology. Clearly, be delighted to answer your questions now, but that is my opening statement. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Blair, for your opening statement. Um, I wonder if, before we get into the very specific uh, matters, um, some of which you've highlighted in your opening statement, we might just take a step back and ask you to restate what you see as being the role of the regulator, particularly since it is a body which um, has a significant um, investment in terms of public expenditure, how would you justify the, the existence of the regulator? What do you see as its role and how would you respond to the criticism that we've sometimes heard in evidence that there's a tendency for the regulator to be involved in the micromanagement um, of housing, individual housing associations and that sometimes your actions are not always proportionate? Okay. Um, Perhaps I can start off, and I'm sure Michael will have something to say. I think our role is actually quite simple, and I think that is because of the statutory objective that we were given when we were set up as a new and independent regulator, and that is to promote and safeguard the interests of tenants and other service users. So I think unlike other regulators, which maybe have a variety of, of objectives, we have only one, uh, and that's very interesting because it guides all of our work in terms of making sure, basically, that tenants and factor donors, uh, homeless people, uh, other service users actually get a good deal from their landlord. Um, so we are very keen to work with the sector, uh, to work with RSLs, to work with local authorities, to ensure that they're providing uh, good homes, warm homes, um, secure homes, safe homes, really important uh, in terms of tenants. Um, we're very keen in terms of our priorities and our risk assessments that we look at where we see the greatest possibility, either for things going wrong or because we have an interest in that particular uh, RSL because of its size or scope or complexity. Um, you mentioned that we have a fair investment in terms of the amount of money. Uh, I would point out that uh, we have only around 50 staff and a budget of just under 4 million. Um, we have a very important role in terms of providing confidence and reassurance to lenders in the sector. Um, lenders have traditionally and continue to see the sector as a, a safe, secure place for investment. And because of that, the sector enjoys preferential interest rates. Uh, recently, uh, one lender estimated that, was, that uh, the value of our regulation was worth around £40 million, which is tenfold uh, the size of our actual budget. So in terms of justifying our existence, I think that's quite a good one in terms of making sure that lenders continue to see effective regulation, robust effective regulation in the sector, um, and uh, that they continue to invest in the sector in Scotland, and that will enable the sector to develop uh, and also to build new homes. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mr Cameron, do you want to address the point that the regulator sometimes, uh, I'm not saying I agree with the point, but the point has been made that the regulator is sometimes involved in micromanagement of the affairs of individual housing associations and that sometimes their actions aren't always proportionate. 
We take very seriously our approach to regulation being one of uh, risk-based and proportionate um, regulation. Um, we, uh, as Kay has set out, we have regard always to our statutory objective of protecting the interests of tenants and other service users, and that's what drives all of our uh, all of our actions. Um, we undertake an annual risk assessment um, of all social landlords that identifies the key areas that we require to engage with those landlords to get appropriate levels of assurance around how they are operating to protect those interests of tenants and other service users. We publish all of that information. Uh, we've gone uh, further than uh, simply publishing the um, actual plans themselves over the last year. Uh, we've published for the first time um, a, a compendium of, of uh, our engagement with landlords, um, both for local authorities and for RSLs. Um, we've also started to publish a series of documents um, called How We Work, which sets out more information and detail on how we apply in practice our regulatory uh, framework. And the first of those documents um, has uh, been developed uh, by in consultation with the key stakeholder groups, the representative bodies of landlords, uh, and has been broadly welcome. And we'll be publishing more of those um, types of documents over the coming months. You think the public and tenants uh, know enough yet about how you carry out those risk assessments? It, it, it's undoubtedly the case that we can um, put more information out there. The next um, of the two How We Work publications will focus specifically on how we go about undertaking our risk assessments, those annual risk assessments. We'll publish one for RSLs and we'll publish another for local authorities, recognising there are slight differences in the process and that with local authorities um, we work in collaboration with our partner scrutiny bodies such as Audit Scotland, Education Scotland, to produce a joint uh, common plan for scrutiny. So we will publish um, a how we work on both um, of those risk assessment processes. Hopefully that will further enhance the information that's available to tenants, landlords and the general public. Okay, I understand the regulator is due to, plan, is due to publish a regulatory advice note in November setting out the key risks and issues you will focus on during the risk assessment process. Are you able to update us on that work? Yes, that, that, that's part of um, our annual cycle of risk assessment. Um, every um, uh, October we commence the next round of risk assessment. And what we want to do this year for the first time is to engage with um, landlords, um, lenders, uh, auditors to the sector, tenants, to um, get their perspective on the key risks um, that, that landlords have to contend with. Um, use that dialogue um, to help inform our approach to risk assessment and then publish um, the key risk areas that we will focus on in the coming year um, and that we will put that out and promote that as widely as we possibly can. Again, to help all uh, involved in, in social housing understand the basis on which we are conducting our regulation. Uh, we've received... Um evidence previously from the, re the Regional Network of Registered Tenants Organisations um, and other um, umbrella organisations representing housing associations. Their submission states that many tenants are not sure what the role of the Scottish Housing Regulator is with regards to investigating conce concerns of tenants. Linked to this, there needs to be more clarity on what constitutes a significant performance failure and timescales on responding. Can you respond to that, that statement, please. Um, firstly, it's probably worth restating that the Parliament has empowered the um, Scottish Public Service Ombudsman to deal with complaints from individual tenants uh, in relation to their landlord. Um, so we are not the body that handles such complaints. Um, when a tenant contacts us with um, a complaint of that nature, we will absolutely work with the tenant to help them understand what the process is, firstly in terms of how they uh, should complain to their landlord and then to the um, SPSO. We have put in place a process um, for tenants to raise serious concerns with us when they feel that their landlord is failing and that that impacts on many or all of the landlord's tenants, and that's what we um, categorise as a significant performance failure. 
I think we appreciate that there can be um, potential for confusion between those two roles. Um, and we've worked with the SPSO to put more information into the public domain to be as clear as possible around those um, distinctive roles. Uh, we've published a fact sheet on um, significant performance failures, um, and we updated that in August 2003. Um, we've also published um, a performance matters report um, on how landlords are informing their tenants um, about significant performance failures as a route for their tenants to raise matters with us. And, and generally, landlords are performing well in terms of communicating that information. As the regulator, and to encourage individual housing associations to, to make that information available to individual tenants. Well, we've required all associations to do that. Um, that's a regulatory requirement. Uh, and then we had undertaken uh, a thematic study into uh, how well uh, landlords were delivering uh, against that requirement. That's the performance matters report I referred to. As I say, we found that generally landlords are performing well in making that information available um, to their landlords. We've also made as much information available uh, and as, in as streamlined a fashion as we can um, through our website to enable um, tenants to raise matters with us directly where they have those serious concerns. Okay. Can I, can I move on and can I ask you uh, what are your plans regarding the introduction of value uh, of money assessments? How, for example, how do you respond to the concerns of Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations that, and I quote, now is not the time for SHR to introduce a further layer of bureaucracy into their assessment process? Um, the last thing we want to do is to add further bureaucracy uh, to our regulatory assessments. Um, value for money is um, one of these topics that's actually quite hard to define because I'm sure if I asked everybody around this table, you would all have a different uh, definition of what value for money means. But uh, we are very aware that when tenants talk to us, we have a tenant panel, for instance, of over 400 tenants that we communicate with regularly. And they consistently say to us that value for money is one of the key topics that they look for in terms of what they get out of their landlord. Um, so we're very aware that this is a key topic. The English regulator has introduced a specific indicator about value for money, but that's much more from an economic perspective. Um, so we were keen just to start a discussion um, with various people in the sector, not to say that we were going to introduce a, a new bureaucratic layer, which is the last thing, as I said before, that we want to do, but actually discuss what does value for money mean, how do landlords who are actually responsible for delivering performance, how do they identify and how do they define value for money in terms of what they're offering as a package to their tenants and to their other customers. So we were, we were very engaged. We, we quite like having debates about strategic issues with various um, stakeholders in the sector. So this was a, an initial debate that we had to say, what do you think? Um, is there something here? Should we be doing more work on this? Should we be asking more of landlords in terms of looking at um, what they are delivering in terms of value for money? So as I, as I say, it was very much an, an initial discussion that we're having with the sector. Yeah, I, mean, I know you can't speak for the, the sector or, or for the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations, but do you think they've been reassured um, as a result of the discussions you've had or do they continue to have concerns about... Well, I, I can say that, the burden being placed upon them. that at the discussion that we had, they took a very active part in that, and uh, we sent out a note afterwards agreeing um, what aspects we were going to cover. So, um, again, I think uh, at the time we were, we were engaged with them. Uh, obviously, we will continue talking and we will continue listening uh, in terms of... But we also, I think, from a tenant perspective, are very keen, keen to ensure that tenants get a good deal. Uh, and that other uh, service users get a good deal. Michael, would you like to add anything? Perhaps just to say that in terms of the, the discussion we had with stakeholders in May uh, around value for money, we, we um, debated uh, after that what our guiding principles might be around um, taking forward a regulatory discussion on, on value for money. Um, at the moment, we give um, uh, landlords a fair amount of scope to define what that means locally. Um, one of our guiding principles will be to move not too far from that position 
um, and we will want to engage fully with the, uh, the sector around this issue as they themselves develop approaches to demonstrating value, money, value for money to their tenants. Um, there's a number of significant pieces of research going on at the moment in the sector in Scotland, uh, and we'll want to have regard to that. Um, so we're very much, as Kay says, in a, in a position of, of, of listening to um, what the views are of a range of stakeholders uh, on this topic, uh, and, and we'll, we'll move cautiously in terms of adopting an appropriate <coughs> regulatory position on value for money, which in large um, um, part will be based on what we already have in terms of charter information and the range of other information that we receive from landlords. Okay. Uh, Mike McKenzie has a short supplementary. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'll keep it as short as I possibly can. It was just um, initially, um, Ms Blair, and you'd mentioned that um, you may have concern about uh, housing associations because of their size. Um, I just wonder if you can elaborate on that and what size got to do with it. And the second point, you mentioned that um, the lenders had said that you had been responsible for saving the sector £40 million in uh, lending costs. Um, I think the period was over a year. Um, I'm just struggling to imagine how anybody could possibly do that calculation. And I would be very grateful if you were able to share um, information with the committee. And I appreciate it's not your calculation, it's a group of lenders, but as we know, the lenders have you know, got their sums rather wrong in fairly recent history. So I would really like to know what that methodology was. And then finally, though, Convener, just a further point. Um, Sorry, Mike, it's meant to be a big supplementary. Okay, yeah. right. okay. thank you. On the first one, on size, um, we take an interest in size because if a very large organisation were to get into trouble, were to suffer financial distress, that would have an impact on the whole of the system, it would have an impact on the sector and on tenants. So in terms of size, we're just very keen that we keep close to some of these organisations, particularly some of the, the bigger ones which have subsidiary developments and which have quite complex structures. So we're just very keen that it's not necessarily that we take an interest because we have a particular concern about any one aspect at the time. It's really just to keep close to them, to make sure. So it's for assurance from our, our point of view. Um, in terms of the 40 million, um, the, uh, the calculation was done on looking at what standard interest rates would be to comparable organisations uh, in the private sector as opposed to social housing. But the exact detail of that calculation I don't have with me at the moment. I don't know whether Michael well, has Perhaps I could um, um, expand upon that a little. The, uh, in the conversations that we had with the, the lenders, they identified that they estimated the average um, reduction in the rates, um, the interest rates that were applied was around about the figure of 115 basis points um, that was directly as a consequence of the organisations that were being lent to being part of a regulated sector. Now, if you extrapolate that um, 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 basis points reduction over the totality of the sector's borrowing, it comes to a figure of round about um, £40 million each year. There's some more written information about that calculation and, and who exactly it came from. We look forward to receiving that. Thank you, Michael. Uh, David, you have some questions. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Ms Blair, in your opening statement, you said that you were a listening and learning organisation. Could you demonstrate how you are listening and learning around the issue of whistleblowing? Yes, indeed. I'm going to ask Michael to do this because he has actually got more information at his fingertips. Yeah, we, we um, have become designated as a proper authority um, to receive disclosures about social landlords from whistleblowers under the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Um, and that means that any whistleblower um, is then... Uh, has the protection set out in the Act if they come to us. It also places upon us certain duties to publish information around um, um, the, the numbers of, of uh, whistleblowing reports that we receive each year. Um, we published uh, updated fact sheets um, in April of this year on whistleblowing, 
one for whistleblowers themselves and uh, another for uh, landlords who may then have to engage with us around a whistleblowing um, uh, report that we have received. We consulted with um, uh, the Glasgow West of Scotland Forum, Employers and Voluntary Housing, and with um, the SFHA in producing um, those fact sheets. Um, we will set out for the first time in uh, our annual report for last year, which will come to Parliament in September, um, the figures. But I can tell you that uh, last year um, we were contacted by six whistleblowers with concerns about landlords. Um, we took no action on two of those um, because the, 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 the whistleblowing information um, lacked sufficient evidence or credibility. Um, we worked with landlords to establish the facts in the other cases. In one, we found that there was no basis for the allegations. Uh, in the others, um, the, the concerns were substantiated in two um, of the cases, and, and one is still um, ongoing. Um, so that gives a sense of, of, of our approach um, to whistleblowing. Have you had any examples of whistleblowers within your own organisation? No. And if you, uh, if you have in the future, um, who would guard the guards if in the sense you're regulating the sector? And I know there's some further questions on this general issue. What procedure would you have if you had whistleblowing within your own organisation? All of the staff of the Scottish Housing Regulator are civil servants. Um, and are fully subject to the civil service code and all of the procedures, including whistleblowing procedures that are there um, for um, civil servants. So uh, there's an extensive um, set of procedures. I'd be happy to get that information to the committee if that would be helpful. And has there been any discussion about the issue of whistleblowing within any board meetings that you've had in the past? Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. We've looked at the policy and agreed the policy and discussed it as a board. Could you also explain in a bit more detail what the role of the special managers will be? Special managers in terms of um, statutory appointments uh, that we make to um, register social landlords or local authorities? Is that the...? Yes. Right. OK. Well, I until... Sorry, particularly in, is there a role for special managers over the issue of whistleblowing, or is that completely separate? Because I don't think there's a lot of clarity what that role will be, so we would appreciate some okay. information on that. A, a special manager is um, a, a person that we would appoint to an organisation um, to uh, undertake either certain investigations or to address certain issues or problems um, that have arisen. Um, we've only used statutory appointments of special managers twice, um, uh, both fairly recently. Where we do that, uh, we set out fully the remit um, and the accountabilities um, so that the organisation that is involved uh, in um, having a special manager placed with them uh, fully understands that special manager's role. We've had some discussions with um, representative bodies around uh, the issue of accountability um, of special managers. Um, special managers um, that we appoint are accountable to the regulator for the delivery of the actions that they are being appointed for. Um, however, they also need to work with the relevant management mm. committee or governing body of the organisation. Could I, sorry, interrupting, so could I give you an example then? Let's look at a fictional one, just so that I'm clear and the committee is clear on the role of the special managers. Um, um, ISL um, has a whistleblower who says that the organisation is not operating pro correct financial accountability. You're concerned about it. You could then set up a special manager to look into that organisation and see if the finances are being done according to the rules and regulations laid down by Parliament, which you regulate. Would that be a fair fictional example in terms of how you would use it? No, that, that's not how that kind of scenario would play out. What, what, if we receive a whistleblowing um, report, the first thing that we will do is we'll assess it in terms of its um, credibility and the level of evidence that is presented. Um, as I say, we may very well decide not to take the matter further if we think um, the whistleblowing report lacks um, credibility or appropriate okay. evidence. If we feel that there is um, sufficient for us to then engage with the organisation, the first thing we would do is ask the organisation itself to undertake an investigation into the matters raised. Uh, now, they may very well do that using um, 
their internal audit function, their external mm. auditors, or appoint an independent body um, to, to, to do that. Um, that. That sometimes, I think, gets confused with being a special manager. Uh, our language for special manager is very much about a statutory appointment made by us. Mm. Okay, so perhaps could you give us a little bit more in detail on the circumstances where you would appoint a special manager? You've done it on two occasions. I appreciate there'd be some confidentiality around this, but are you able to describe in general terms the two circumstances um, that yes. in the past? Uh, and actually, we've published the information on both of those cases in regulation plans for the organisations mm. concerned. So there's, there's there's quite a bit of information out there, and we'd, again, we'd be happy to share that with um, the committee. In one of the organisations, um, it was that we became concerned about um, its financial health, um, and in particular that there was a, a, a near risk of insolvency, mm. um, and we weren't um, able to obtain appropriate assurances from the organisation that it was dealing with the issues, mm. uh, and on that basis we uh, made a statutory appointment. We made a statutory appointment to both um, a special manager role, uh, and also yeah. we appointed three members to the organisation's mm. management I, committee. I, and, and sorry if I'm being a bit slow in this issue. My, my fictional example, you recall, was about an RSL where a whistleblower yep. uh, demonstrated there was some financial problem with the organisation, and you said that wasn't really appropriate, but yet what you've just described there is financial problems in an organisation and you've appointed a special manager. Why was my example incorrect? The, the first example you highlighted was that we received a report from a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. um, th the first thing we would do upon receiving a, a report from a whistleblower mm. is consider the substance of that, mm. um, and then we would look to the organisation to investigate that in the first instance. Mm. The situation I've just described in terms of our appointment of statutory manager was uh, following our engagement, our direct engagement with the organisation over a period of time to try and deal with a number of concerns mm. that we had around its financial viability um, that then led to us having to take mm. that intervention action. Yeah. So different circumstances. Yeah. And just finally, I won't uh, uh, be too much like a dog in a bone this issue, but I'm not suggesting that the special manager is the first thing you do. Uh, I, mean, mm. I think that's quite understandable. But all I'm saying is there is a possibility if there was supposed to blowing and you weren't satisfied with what the organisation was doing, that you may consider this at the end of the day as one option you may have if you're not satisfied with what the RSL is doing? It, I, I think if we were um, concerned that the organisation wasn't taking the matter seriously mm. um, or some of the issues that were being uncovered were so significant um, mm. that actually further action had to be taken, there is the possibility that we could appoint a special manager in mm. those circumstances. Right, that's fine. That's, that certainly adds a, a lot more clarity. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, Mary, you have some questions. Yes, thank you. Um, b before I ask you about communication and engagement, just so it clarifies things for me, would or could a special manager be appointed after a notifiable event? A notifiable event could be um, the first indication that we would need right. to engage with an organisation, and depending on the, the, mm -hmm. the issue, the scale of it, could ultimately lead to um, a, a, a situation where a special manager became involved. But a notifiable event in itself wouldn't necessarily yeah. trigger uh, that response. I just wanted to see if yeah. there was a connection between, between the two. Can I move on to communication and engagement? Because in, in previous um, evidence sessions with both tenant organisations and tenants, concerns have been raised about the methods that the regulator uses to communicate with tenants and tenants' organisations and the frequency. So can you give us a bit more detail of the steps that you've taken to improve those things? Yes, I can. Um, and, and tenants are a, a, a very important audience for us. Um, last year we asked um, all registered tenants' organisations uh, for their preferences about how they would wish to receive information from us. Um, and they told us largely that, that um, they preferred hard copy summary documents. Um, so we've responded to that by placing um, much more emphasis on producing such publications. We've done that for our national panel report, for our um, registered tenant organisation priority research, and for a regulatory guidance consultation, um, to name um, a few. Uh, we'll also shortly um, issue a hard copy summary of this year's um, report on the national panel, and we'll send that to all 
um, RTOs. We also send um, the nine regional networks of RTOs our electronic newsletter, um, and that goes out on a, a, a frequent basis. Uh, we've also promoted that uh, electronic newsletter to all RTOs and encouraged them to subscribe, and at least 134 have done so. Um, we uh, continue to work with our committed group of tenant assessors. Um, we've established and provide resources to um, the new um, RTO liaison group. Um, we meet with that group quarterly. Um, and alongside that, um, myself and one of our board me uh, uh, members meets annually with the chairs and secretaries groups of the, the regional, uh, regional network. I'd also emphasise the, the role of our national panel uh, of tenants and service users. Uh, this is a very important way for us to engage with and communicate with tenants. Um, we'll sh we published the output of um, the second year of work with the panel um, last Friday. Um, the panel now has 430 members, um, up from 300 last year, and around three quarters of the panel members are not members of any other form of tenant organisation or representative um, structure. Um, and while most of them are tenants, last year we also, um, through the panel, engaged with 48 Gypsy Travellers, um, and some of them were already panel members. Um, they are all now signed up to receive panel updates and to work with us uh, for um, um, further uh, in engagements. Um, and we'll continue to, to look to broaden out um, the representative nature um, of the, the tenants panel. Um, we'll continue to discuss with um, the different representative structures that we engage with for tenants, how we can um, further improve our communication. Uh, but I think over the last year, we've, we've, we've done a lot to try and um, ensure that tenants get the right information from us at the right time. The other key thing is that we do require every landlord to provide every tenant with a copy of the landlord report that we publish every year on each of those, um, those landlords. And do you use the national panel and the tenant assessors to almost assess the improvements that you've made in your communications? And how often do you meet with them? We, we do do that. Um, we meet with the tenant assessors regularly, and they've been an important uh, way for us to test different developments. How often? It, it can be... Um, I mean, we meet with all of the tenant assessors twice a year, um, but we actually engage with them on a far more frequent basis than that depending on what piece of work they're on. They'll, they'll work with us on thematic studies um, and inquiries. We uh, involved our tenant assessors in developing uh, the landlord report uh, and the key indicators that we would focus on in the charter. Um, we've also used them to um, test uh, our IT systems in terms of how, how accessible and easy they are for people to, um, to make use of. So it, it, that's very much a continuous ongoing engagement that we have with our tenant assessors. And while there's been acknowledgement that improvements have been made in communications, there are still concerns that it's, it's too slow in maturing and too slow in, in moving. Would you agree with that? Or is there any way that you can move things along more quickly? As I say, I think we'll, we'll want to discuss those concerns with um, the RTO liaison group that we meet with regularly. Um, to better understand those concerns, um, uh, I, you know, I, I think we put a lot of information out for tenants. We do that um, regularly. We engage with them in a range of different ways. But we would be keen to understand what those concerns may be and how we can um, build on uh, what we already have in place. And a concern from the regional networks was that you're not visual enough and that the, the regulator needs to get out there more. How would you respond to that? Maybe I can take that one. Um, I think that's a good point in terms of visibility. I think every organisation can be more visible. Um, and we do, we have done, particularly this year, we have put a huge emphasis behind communication, behind engagement with a variety of our stakeholders, from lenders, from government, um, to landlords, to tenant organisations, etc. So we do have a huge communications plan. 
Um, but we are quite a small organisation and we do have a big job to do in terms of effective regulation, in terms of being risk-based, being proportionate be, uh, and engaging effectively with those organisations where we need to engage. So it's getting the balance right. And I'm very aware, because I come from a communications background, I'm very aware that you can never do enough to communicate. Um, and I'm very aware that sometimes when you put information out, it's not necessarily the information that is most received. So we've done a lot of work in making sure uh, and engaging with our assessors, as Michael has said, engaging with our panel to say, how good are we at communicating? Where could we be better? Um, what do you want? So it's an ongoing process. And hopefully we can only, from, from a good base, I think we can only hopefully get better. Okay. The regional networks have also suggested that there's evidence that landlords are reneging on their legal requirement to consult with tenants. Um, how do you feel about that and would you agree with that and if you do, how, what steps will you take to resolve that? Um, as Michael has said before, there is a legal requirement, statutory requirement um, for all landlords to um, give the landlord report to their tenants. Um, and we often hear from tenants that they don't get enough information from the landlord. Um, so one of the things we do, as well as our um, regulation plans, we have what we call thematic inquiries, um, which are really mini research projects where we go in and look at particular topics. And at the moment, we've taken the charter and looked at various aspects of the charter, including communication, um, particularly looking at communication around rent increases, for instance. Are landlords actually performing well in this area? Um, mostly we're told when we actually ask tenants and the charter tells us they're satisfied with their landlord's performance and, and with the information they get. Um, but we're very keen to make sure that we have hard data behind that to make sure that's happening. I mean, the Tenants Network has suggested that a thematic inquiry be done into um, the degree of communication that landlords have. Is that something you would consider? Yes, we are considering it, and that will probably happen this year, okay. depending on our resources. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Alex. Thanks very much, convener. Uh, I was going to move on to the issue of the Social Housing Charter annual returns. Uh, we've had information from the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations suggesting that the use of inconsistent language when reporting on charter performance of housing associations and local authorities is concerning them. Why might this be, and have you any plans to revise the language you use? I think, firstly, we, to, it would be worth saying that we would welcome the fact that our publications and the information we're putting out there is generating debate and discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, that's uh, certainly one of the objectives we had in, in getting that information out into the public domain. We collect the same data from all um, social landlords from both um, RSLs and local authorities and we use the same indicators in our risk assessment of both of those um, groups of landlords in terms of, of the charter um, data. Uh, this year, following our risk assessment, um, we're engaging with just over two-thirds of local authorities on matters relating to the Charter. We're engaging with around about one third of RSLs um, uh, and the bulk of the, the engagement we're having with RSLs actually relates more to financial health matters than, than to the Charter. So proportionately we're engaging with around about twice the number of councils on Charter matters than, than we are with RSLs. Um, so I think in terms of the, the issues that have been raised, I don't think there's any evidence that we're being any less critical of, of local authorities than we are being of RSLs. The two processes that we use to publish the, inf the information on how we'll engage following the risk assessments um, are slightly different in that for local authorities, we're part of a broader um, um, approach that involves all of the um, 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 scrutiny partners uh, that we work with on, on local authorities. Um, so the, the final product is co-produced there. Um, we're we're um, not um, um, convinced that there are significant differences in our use of language across um, the, the two types of, of, of landlord. That said, this is the first year that we've done this approach with the charter information. Uh, and we'd be keen, actually, to engage with um, the forum um, to discuss our concerns, pick up on those, and to, to address where we can uh, any issues that, that, that may arise. And we have um, a meeting planned for within the next few weeks um, to do just that. 
So perhaps no plans to revise, but a willingness to engage at this Absolutely. stage. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you. Um, what feedback have you had on the use of online land, the online landlord comparison tool? We've had exceptionally good feedback. Um, people have told us that it's easy to use, uh, that they can get the information that they need. Um, we've had very good feedback about how they can use that information to compare their particular landlord with um, the chosen group that they choose of uh, peers in the sector. So it's very, um, it, it's very helpful for them. Um, and, and we're very keen. Um, we, we've we've actually, as I said, we've won awards about the ease of use and and how we've developed that particular technology. So I think it's working well. Uh, again, it will be subject to review to make sure that that it continues to work well. Uh, have you changed the information which landlords have to submit on their annual for their annual return on the charter? No. no. The it's been suggested uh, by some tenants' uh, representat representatives that there has been a change. Is there any reason why that impression might have been given? I actually don't know because there has been no change. So obviously uh -huh. it's something I'd be keen to find out about why they think that. I mean, the major change will be that uh, because we're in the second year of collecting the data, tenants will actually be able to compare the second year of their landlord's performance with the first year. So it's the start of a comparison, a benchmarking exercise, um, which will be helpful um, for tenants to compare over time. But the actual information has not changed. Okay, thank you very much. Dave, did you have a supplementary? Um, Can yes. I limit you to one? Please? Thank you. I'll keep it, very, I'll keep it briefly. Uh, Ms Blue, you know that we've got a petition uh, later on in our agenda um, which argues that RSLs should be subject to freedom of information. Um, could you ask your views on that? Because I understand from the Commissioner that the Charter requirement falls short of freedom of information and that you cannot uh, require an RSL to provide particular information to the individual. Is the Information Commissioner's assessment correct? And what's your view on this? Actually, we don't have a view. Um, so, so That's I'm sorry, I can't. I, my that, answer is quite brief. Is it something to do with the fact you've got 50 civil servants working for your organisation? <laughs> well, I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> um, but we don't have a view on this. Um, we do think that the charter gives valuable information, and uh, most tenants tell us that they are satisfied with that information. But in terms of having a formal view about FOI, we don't have that. Is the Commissioner's assessment correct that the Charter requirement falls short of Freedom of Information Act? I think it's safe to say that the Charter sets out a standard um, that encourages landlords to communicate um, effectively and fully with their tenants. Um, now, it doesn't put in place, uh, it doesn't attempt to put in place the same kind of um, requirements and procedural um, responsibilities that the Freedom of Information Act does. Um, I think you know you would I, I suggest be surprised if, if a charter did that. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, as 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 Kay has said, um, our analysis of landlords' first annual re um, returns um, highlights the importance that that landlords are placing on being kept informed um, by their landlord, but also that that satisfaction levels with how landlords are performing in that regard. Are, are pretty good. Um, so, you know, it's relatively early stages for the Charter, um, and we'll continue to monitor and, and look at the trends uh, in terms of landlords' performance in that regard. But at this point, we see no evidence of a risk to tenants' interests regarding landlords' provision of information to them. Right. Thank you. I'm going to move on now, and James, you have some questions. Thank you, convener. Uh, Ms Blair, in your, your opening comments, you talked about one of the primary functions of the regulator being to be there when the, you felt that things were going wrong. Uh, would that focus on that explain partly why the RSLs are showing concern about the tone and content of the Governance Matters publications, which they, they seem to perceive to be a bit overly negative at times? Uh, and is there a role for that publication to be used to sort of disseminate best practice amongst the RSLs? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of 
governance matters. Um, we have always said as a regulator that our role is not just to highlight weaknesses uh, and bad practice, but actually to highlight good practice as well. Uh, and over the last year, we've done a lot in terms of putting out a series of publications called Performance Matters, where we do highlight good practice. And we do use that um, to help landlords in their own um, induction, training, etc. Uh, I think that's been very helpful. Uh, in terms of governance matters, we were very keen uh, that when we did discover issues, challenges, particular weaknesses in organisations, that as far as possible we could share some of that information on an anonymous basis, uh, clearly. But actually, again, as a learning tool. And I have to say that... Um, I have heard about the tone and content, and we've obviously taken that on board. Um, but a number of organisations have said to me that as soon as they get this publication, they use it to go and check in their organisation that they're not doing similar things, that they're actually performing well, and that they're not falling into perhaps some of the traps that are highlighted in these case studies. So I suppose I would take some issue with the view that they're all entirely negative and we've had a negative response because I think a number of organisations have found them very valuable as a learning tool to use in their own organisation. Um, that said, um, alongside our governance matters, we ran a series of events called Governance Events uh, and, and matters, and we had hugely positive uh, response about these events. And again, we used the Governance Matters series as the basis for discussion, uh, which allowed board members to get together, committee members, to network, to learn about other experiences in other organisations. And I think that's really important. So, yes, we do share bad practice, but we try and do it in a constructive way um, as a learning tool. Um, and our next issue of Governance Matters, which will come out shortly, actually talks about an organisation where we identified serious issues. Uh, that organisation at the beginning did not want particularly to engage with us. Um, it did subsequently engage with us really constructively, and we had a very positive outcome at, at the end. Uh, and the organisation itself would say that it had a very positive outcome at the end. So um, perhaps a long answer to your question, but I, I hope it answers it. Yes, to, to a great extent it does. But uh, So w what you're saying is that Governance Matters deals with the <laughs> shorthand version here, right? Governance Matters deals with the, the bad stuff and Performance Matters highlights the good stuff that's going on. It's not necessarily as black and white as yeah. that because Performance Matters sometimes look, looks at issues um, that are more to do with charter and more to do with service delivery, etc. So it's not quite as black and white as that. But, um, but if it's not as black and white as that, is there space then in the Governance Matters to highlight one or two examples Oh, yes. of good practice to yes. say that and this we, is, this is the said, sort of we, governance practice you should yeah. be following. We, we have done that. We will continue to do that. Okay. Uh, one of the other issues that, that was raised by the RSLs was uh, the matter of trust between the regulator, yourselves, and, and the RSLs. Can you give us an update on the work that you're doing to take forward the, a building of trust within the sector? Yes, absolutely. Um, there is a huge push from the board and within the organisation to make sure that we are engaging effectively at all levels. Um, so we have, over the last year, uh, we have continued to have meetings with representative bodies, uh, with the lending community. We uh, continue to um, make sure that we are regularly in touch with, with lenders, both within Scotland and within the UK, to make sure that we're engaging. Uh, we have board board meetings. We have uh, I have a... a Chairs meeting with the chair, for instance, of the SFHJ on a regular basis. Um, so at all levels within the organisation, we are engaging. Um, and, and I think that's hopefully that is helping trust. Um, my desire is that we <coughs> understand each other's perspectives because sometimes they will be quite different, um, but that we respect each other's perspectives and we have a relationship of mutual respect and understanding. And can I ask then, uh, has that process been improving? Have you been having more meetings? Has there been an understanding from the RSLs about the, the efforts that you're going to uh, and vice versa to build up that relationship of trust? I hope so. I certainly think so. I think we're making good progress. Um, sometimes I have to say the representative bodies may not like what we're doing because, as I said, our statutory objective is to protect tenants um, and uh, to, to strive for improved performance, uh, even better performance in the sector. And uh, 
sometimes we, we agree to differ. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Adam. Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks about uh, you're hoping to have a, a fully formed appeals process in place for April next year. Is that, that right. correct? And, and you're currently engaging in a, a consultation process, which I understand is a two-stage process. It is. Can you, can you flesh out some of the details of that? For yes, me, I can. I'll, I'll perhaps um, speak initially, and then Michael uh, will talk about this. Um, but we're very keen, obviously, to have an appeals process that's transparent, that's proportionate, um, that works for us and works for those who, who use the appeals process. So what we've decided to do is to engage at a very early stage with a discussion paper, uh, looking at what should the principles around this be, what should the process be, what do you think of it, um, and that will happen in September. Um, thereafter, and um, towards the end of October, November, we will issue, having had the response from that, and also as well as having issued the discussion paper, we will also have meetings and you know, appropriate dialogue uh, with others in the sector. We will then issue a consult consultation paper in terms of, look, this is our firm proposal, what do you think of it? Michael? Okay. Nothing really to add to that other than we want to ensure that there are as many opportunities as possible for all stakeholders to engage with us. Uh, that's the, the, the motivation for um, a two-stage process. We want to ensure that we get this right in terms of an appeal process, uh, and we want to ensure that as many people as possible have had that opportunity to engage with us. Yes, the umbra umbrella organisations have obviously welcomed uh, the fact that you're doing this, uh, but they're, they're keen, obviously, that the, the process is truly, uh, or the, the appeals process itself is truly independent and uh, provides an avenue of redress for all relevant aspects of the, the regulator's decision making. Uh, I take it that's your intention for that to to be the outcome? Well, certainly the um, strategic code um, uh, introduced by the Scottish Government earlier this year uh, sets out the principle of an independent approach um, to appeals. Um, we will set out um, to have a full discussion about exactly what that would mean to the range of stakeholders and how we can best accommodate those range of views within that. Uh, I think it's also though, important to state that it's, it's, it's critical that any appeals process is proportionate um, and that it's not a, a tool that it can be used to prevent a regulator doing the things that it needs to do. So there's always a balance within that to be struck. But we will absolutely engage um, fully with stakeholders around the very topics that you've set out, the scope of any appeals process, the level of independence that we can ensure is built into that. Yeah. Uh, for instance, with uh, SFHA, uh, we'll, we'll go on to talk about the entitlements, payments and benefits policy a wee bit later. Um, but um, if an organisation were to, to opt out of any element of that uh, due to their local circumstances, uh, was, would the, the uh, and were the Re the regulator to to decide that the organisation's identified alternative pro approach was inappropriate, um, is, would they have an avenue of redress to appeal that decision by the regulator? Is that would that be your intention? Well, I I, I wouldn't want to prejudge the outcome of any discussion and and, and consultation. I think that that very um, scenario is something that we can debate with stakeholders. Is that a relevant matter to be included in any um, appropriate appeals process that we put in place? Okay, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> could you ask now what progress you've made around the issuing of revised guidance on notifiable events, particularly when a senior officer leaves uh, an RSL? As Kay mentioned in her opening statement, we've had... Um, very positive and constructive responses to um, the recent consultation we've undertaken on revising our regulatory guidance, including that that relates to notifiable events. And our aim here was absolutely to update that guidance, uh, but also to streamline um, our requirements. 
also, as Kay said, we're reviewing the independent analysis of that uh, of the feedback back to, to that consultation, uh, and we'll publish that along with um, the revised guidance later in the in the summer. Yesterday, at our board meeting, we agreed to make some further changes um, to the guidance on notifiable events to reflect further the comments that that we've received back from some of the uh, landlord representative groups, specifically on the issue of. Um, um, responses to the situation where a senior officer leaves. So we're confident that when we publish that guidance later in the summer, um, uh, it, it will be recognisably changed to what was there before. Okay, so can you give us a flavour of the of the change uh, at this stage, or is it too early? It, it, it's very much shifting the, um, the um, focus from requiring in most situations an option appraisal to one which is very much focusing on where an organisation has an appropriate and up-to-date business plan strategy that that in itself is the basis on which it can proceed to move to reappoint a chief executive. Very much um, worked with um, the different representative bodies on the language around this and it very much reflects those conversations. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, and the final question I have is, uh, what progress have you made in developing a procurement framework agreement on the appointment of consultants? If you recall, this was a yes. particular point of criticism we had. As the, I'm sure the committee will appreciate, um, there are many complexities and technicalities in procurement frameworks. We are currently working with uh, legal and procurement advisors to work through um, those complexities, particularly to um, enable us to achieve the ambition we have of having a framework agreement that's not just available to the regulator, but one that's also available to social landlords to access and make use of. So uh, we hope to have a, a clearer position on that later in the year. Okay. Uh, I think there's a lot of criticism at the time that the these consultants were very expensive and uh, there weren't any in, uh, actually in Scotland. We had, to import we had to import them. So do you think that that situation will be um, addressed by what you're doing? That, that's our, our hope that what will happen is that there will be much greater um, transparency around um, appointment of um, contractors, consultants um, on the basis of a framework agreement um, and obviously um, framework agreements are, are tendered through um, processes that, to ensure appropriate value for money. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Thank you, convener. You said in your written evidence to the committee, the most recent submission, that uh, and, 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 and uh, Ms Blair uh, reiterated it in her opening statement this morning, um, suggesting that you fully endorse the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations model policy on entitlements, payment and benefits. And you said in particular that this takes account of the needs of landlords working in rural and remote communities. And that's reassuring, but the feedback I have from housing associations across rural Scotland and indeed from the Scottish Federation of Housing Association is that the model policy, the draft model policy, has got a number of real problems with it and that it specifically does not address or take account of the needs of rural landlords. Could you perhaps explain how you seem to have got this wrong? Um, well, for a start, I would say we haven't got it wrong because it's not our code. It's the SFHA's code uh, and model policy, which they have uh, developed. It's taken some time for them to develop it, but we are now in a position to endorse it. So I would just like to make that clear at the beginning. In terms of getting it wrong, we've worked, um, I think, quite constructively um, and uh, over a period of time uh, to ensure that whatever the SFHJ produced was of sufficient quality, uh, was meeting our principles around ethics, around integrity, 
Um, and we had very high-level principles which we wanted the code to embrace, which it now has. Um, we were also very aware of the needs of rural and remote communities. And I think it's something, Mr Mackenzie, that you brought up uh, at the last session. Uh, and we're very aware that in certain circumstances, there is a limited market. Uh, and in these circumstances, of course, staff, etc., um, should be in a position to use, if there is only one contractor, to use that contractor, um, providing, of course, them, they, they make sure that it's... Uh, at a, at a rate Thank that you. is acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we were very keen in terms of uh, the code that that was spelt out, but the SFHJ actually took that part out of the code, as far as I'm aware, um, because they wanted to make sure that everybody in Scotland, if there were particular, particularly difficult circumstances or just special circumstances, uh, that there would be flexibility in their code. So there is that flexibility that has been introduced into the code. Um, the SFHJ have said that they will publish the code by the end of this week and that it will run, I think they're proposing that it should run for a year, by which time they will have an opportunity to um, monitor it and to see and review how it's working, but it is their code. Thank you. Yes, I was aware of that, and but I'm, I'm still not quite grasping this, Neil. Please bear with me. Yeah. Um, the what I'm struggling to understand is that you've said that you fully endor endorse it. Yes? Yes, we And yet we it. don't know quite what the finished version of it is going to be yet. And also, and I welcome the flexibility, but the flexibility, as I understand it, gives um, uh, local housing associations the ability to kind of delete certain aspects of the code that they're not comfortable with or feel that's unworkable and substitute their own arrangements. Now, without prior knowledge of that, how can you possibly endorse it? Um, because, well, um, because there are high-level principles, and what is said in the code, and Michael might have the exact wording, but what is said in the code is that, in terms of flexibility, they can, if their circumstances dictate, alter the code, the SFHJ's code, as long as they still comply with high-level Principles. It's back to this sort of comply and explain, which we've taken out that, or the, the SFHJ have, have not uh, accepted that wording because they felt it wouldn't be understood. But basically, it's to enable, in particularly difficult or particularly challenging local circumstances, to allow that flexibility. But, but surely, is it not the case then that whilst you fully endorse it in principle, you would reserve the right then to come to a, a different view if you found that you know, in these quite subjective and difficult matters that you may take a different view of how any individual housing association chooses to interpret those high-level principles that you've just described. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's worth restating that what we have endorsed is a model policy produced by the SFHA. It's then for individual landlords to decide whether they wish to adopt that model policy and whether they wish to adopt that model policy with appropriate revisions. Um, that's for landlords um, to decide upon. Um, it's then obviously the responsibility of landlords um, to ensure that that policy is implemented and adhered to, and that they monitor um, their uh, management of that policy, which is then implemented. That's, that's for landlords um, to determine. Yeah, I'm, 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 still, I'm still struggling to quite understand. You know, you said in no uncertain terms that the, um, the needs of landlords working in rural and remote communities had been particularly taken into account and dealt with. But actually, most of the representations on that same model policy that I've had, that the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations has had, and that the Employers in Voluntary Housing, EVA, have had, is on specifically criticisms on those points. So, you know, I, 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 I cannot understand how you can be of the view that, that the rural concerns have been fully addressed and that the whole sector is of the view that they haven't been, been addressed. Perhaps for, for further clarification, um, what we asked the SFHA to include in the policy was a statement that said that where local market conditions meant that it was difficult for a member of staff or a governing body of an RSL to achieve a reasonable selection of, of contractors that they would be able to, in those circumstances, 
uh, make use of the landlord's own contractors. We felt that that um, uh, ensured that in those more remote and rural areas um, there was flexibility. We actually encouraged the SFHA to include direct reference to rural and highland um, as an example of where that local market condition context could be taken into account. Uh, I think they were keen not to have an example as they felt that might um, be interpreted as being the only circumstances in which um, um, that flexibility could be used. Um, we are then also very um, keen, and this has been our position for some time, that landlords have flexibility around how they use the model and that where there are particular circumstances uh, in their context, they are able to determine that they wouldn't use specific aspects of the model policy and that they would adopt their own approaches, still in the spirit um, of, of the model um, and still adhering to regulatory standards, but they have that flexibility. Um, and that's what I think gives landlords a degree of... Um, um, as I say, flexibility uh, and the opportunity to make it relevant to their own context. Final question, convener. Um, given that this is a, a kind of ongoing piece of work that seems not to have yet got to completion and that has taken some four years or so, and that the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations have asked the committee to keep it under review, um, would you be prepared to keep the committee informed of progress um, and can I ask, you stated that you are a listening and learning organisation, can I ask that you listen a wee bit more carefully to local housing associations and that you t attempt to learn about their problems a wee bit more quickly? I think on, on monitoring, um, absolutely, we'd be more than, more than happy to report back to the committee in terms of any matters that come to our attention in relation to this. Um, um, we'll, we'll discuss further with the SFHA its intentions around monitoring. I think when any organisation introduces a new policy or, or proposal, it makes sense to, to, to monitor the implementation of that. So we'll, we'll, we'll discuss with SFHA um, its plans in that regard. Um, I, and as I say, we can certainly bring back to the committee any instances where we become engaged and, and uh, have to take a view on a landlord's implementation of the model or its own determined policy. Um, in terms of, of continuing to listen, absolutely, and I think as, as, as Kay has already set out, we have a number of processes in place where we um, gather in views. Uh, I think our uh, recent event with stakeholders on value for money was an excellent example of where early on in conversations we will engage um, to help fully understand the range of different views that there are to enable us to take that into account when we're developing approaches and policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, perhaps you can summarise for the committee what your key priorities in further developing the regulatory regime uh, will be and in particular how you intend to continue to engage with all of the relevant stakeholders in taking forward this work. Um, thank you, convener. Um, in April, we published our next corporate plan, which covers the period from 2015 to 2018. Um, obviously, again, I would emphasise the, the focus is very much on tenants and good outcomes for tenants and other service users. So to that end, we'll continue to look at our three main priorities, financial health, uh, absolutely critical in terms of going forward, particularly given the context that uh, RSLs are operating in, which is increasingly challenging. Uh, I think there is a wider range of risk around. Um, I'm thinking of things like welfare reform, which could impact uh, quite seriously on uh, income streams. I'm thinking of um, pension liabilities, of the inflation uh, rate and implications around that. Um, so a number of areas that we'll be taking a very keen interest in going forward. So financial health is absolutely critical. Good governance uh, since our inception. We put a huge store behind uh, well-managed, well-governed organisations. Um, I think inevitably when we find that an organisation gets into trouble, it starts off because of poor governance, uh, perhaps poor risk management, risk mitigation. 
uh, perhaps poor understanding of some of the financial complexities that organisations have got themselves into. So good governance will be absolutely critical. Um, good service delivery, and there I'm talking about good homes, uh, good repair service, warm homes, a lot of that information comes out of the Charter and increasingly we will be looking using our new analytical tools which are being incredibly helpful um, we'll be looking to get a much um, deeper insight into the organisations we regulate. So again it's good service for tenants and others, it's financial health, good governance. In terms of engagement, I think we have a huge commitment to engaging with all our stakeholders, obviously with representative bodies, clearly with tenant organisations and very much listening to some of the feedback we've had today about um, tenant organisations and where we can do more and taking that on board. Um, we will have a number of thematic inquiries um, where we will drill down uh, in more detail. Um, for instance, Gypsy Travellers is an area that we're really keen to get more information um, from and to use that information. Factor Donors is another one where uh, we feel perhaps we don't have enough information. So again, looking at certain aspects, both of the customer base, um, but also um, performance issues. Um, and, and obviously, keeping vigilant to new risk um, it's a, it's a complex sector. It's a very diverse sector. I mean, I think one challenge with any model policy is that one size doesn't necessarily fit all in the sector because the sector has become much bigger. It's become much more diverse and much more complex. And we, as a regulator, has to make sure have to make sure that we are um, ahead of the game, that we understand the risks, the sensitivities, and the challenges out there. So a lot of our work is analytical, making sure that we have the right market intelligence, and uh, making sure that we're engaging with the lending community, which is absolutely critical to the sector, to make sure that lending um, community still sees the sector as a very viable area in which to engage. So very um, focused priorities uh, for the board and the organisation, uh, which we will continue. Thank you. Do you have anything to add, Mr Cameron? No, nothing to add. OK. Members, do you have any further questions for the witnesses? In that case, it uh, only remains for me to thank our witnesses for their evidence this morning and for the continuing constructive engagement between the regulator and this committee. Uh, I'm now going to suspend our meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the room. Thank you.
John, we now resume our meeting of the committee. Um, firstly, we have agenda item three, um, public petitions. The committee will now consider two public petitions. Firstly, we have the committee's first consideration of PE 1539 by Anne Booth on housing associations to come under the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002. I believe, Mr Don, you have a statement to make. Yes, uh, uh, just for the record, just to, uh, to be on the side of safety, I I'd like to put on the record that I was a member of the GHA board between 2008 and 2012, which is now, of course, part of the, the weekly group. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a paper providing details of previous consideration of the petition by the Public Petitions Committee has been circulated for members' consideration. Uh, a number of actions have already been taken by the Public Petitions Committee, including inviting the petitioners to appear uh, before that committee uh, and to make a presentation and to answer questions on the petition. Can I invite members to consider what action it wishes to take in relation to the petition? Dave. Um, members will know I put a question to the regulator about this, and they were obviously they have no position uh, on it. I mean, I have to say I'm generally sympathetic to uh, this uh, petition, um, as I pointed out in my question and in the additional papers from the petitioner. The, the, the charter is fine and well, and I'm not criticising the charter, but they make it quite clear, and I think Rosemary Agnew says this, that the charter falls short of freedom of information right. And it does not provide the same level of access, I am quoting this, to information to enable public scrutiny. Um, I mean, generally, I, mean, I cannot speak for government, but government is very enthusiastic about freedom of information. Mm -hmm. I am not clear why it can't yeah. be extended to housing associations. If there is particular issues, uh, in addition to the recommendations that we have got and actions, why do not we write to a cross-section of ourselves and get their first-hand view on this? Is there a practice? Of who? Uh, registered social Are ourselves, sorry, yes. I thought you said ourselves. Uh, no. <laughs> it's, getting, it's getting late in the session, uh, convener, so perhaps. I don't know if it's my speech or your hearing. Maybe a combination of both. Um, but I, I would think it's useful to get first hand mm. their particular views <clears throat> on this area. And I, to be honest, I cannot understand why we're not supporting this. I mean, free information is something. Um, We've supported on a cross-party basis, I think. Um, I, I think it should apply to housing associations. If there's a reasons why they themselves don't want this to happen, let's hear direct from them. OK. Uh, that's fine. Um, we'll consider that, that suggestion. I think it's only fair to point out that a number of the registered social landlords have already um, written to, I think, the Public Petitions Committee on this issue. So we do have their views uh, on the record. But we can consider... Uh, whether or not to write to them again. Um, anyone else? Mike? Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not necessarily suggesting that I disagree with it, but I do think that uh, a factor that has to be considered um, at a time when public budgets are you know, under stress, that some of the housing associations, and I would imagine particularly the smaller ones, may feel that they lack the resources to deal with the inevitable uh, requests under FOI that, that they would have to deal with, and that that resource might be you know, better spent providing warm, better houses and so on. So I can uh, imagine f some of these are really quite small organisations, and I think it could be quite uh, onerous on them to, to comply with FOI. Uh, Mary and then Alex. Dave, um, Dave actually covered um, well, more or less all of the points that, that I would have raised, and, and I absolutely support the views that he's expressed. Um, the only thing I would add in, in relation to the points that um, Mike's just made in, in regards to resourcing, if we do go down the course of action that, that, that Dave has suggested and, and, and I support in contacting RSLs, that, that could be an area that we could ask them to expand on, on the resourcing issue. Okay, uh, Alex? Yes, the, on the face of it, uh, it's difficult to argue against this proposal, uh, and the likely uh, the likely difficulties will be relating to implementation. And I wondered if it might be an idea at this stage to cut out the middle of the process and simply engage directly with the government and see what their views are uh, about progress in this. Okay, that that's fine. Um, Sorry, can I um, back in. I mean, I think the big issue here is that we're under legislative requirement to do this under the Human Rights Act. So no one's disputing what the Act says. I think what government says is there's some technical reasons why um, 
housing associations or ourselves shouldn't be included. And there is an answer to that from the, from the petitioner. Mm -hmm. And I do appreciate we've had some information already um, from RSLs. Obviously, I would suggest that we address uh, the specific point about costs, and obviously those organisations mm -hmm. that haven't yet responded yeah. would be the ones that the clerks should focus on. OK. Do any other members have any suggestions? OK, we've, we've got uh, two suggestions. One, that we write to a range of RSLs asking for their views and perhaps um, most sensibly focusing on those RSLs who have not yet um, expressed a view, although we could write to RSLs who have already uh, written um, with a more focused um, inquiry. Um, there's been a suggestion that we write to the Scottish Government, although I think in, if we were to do that, I think we would want the Government not just to reiterate its previous uh, response to the petitioners, but actually to respond to some of their um, points that they've made in response to the Scottish Government's response. I hope that makes sense. But uh, the, the Scottish Government has responded to the petitioners already, so I don't think we would just want a reiteration of their earlier response. Uh, are we happy to proceed? Could we mention the government's cons consultation? On, on that basis? Okay. Um, I think another point that's worth um, considering is that there is already a consultation on the Freedom of Information Scotland Act and also on the forthcoming Scottish Housing Charter. Now, notwithstanding the fact that the petitioners have um, questioned the, 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 um, the, whether that is a good idea or not, I think that is certainly a, a formal process that exists, and I, I think that we should encourage the petitioners to engage with that process, because that is an obvious route for them to, uh, to, to engage with um, the consultation on the Act and on the Housing Charter. Uh, Dave. Can I restate my earlier point yeah. is I think my view is that the Charter um, is something that's worthy and is good and worth support. Um, but as the Information Commissioner has pointed out, it does not give you the teeth that Freedom of Information Act no, does. Can I ask you, as Dave suggested, then, that we don't encourage people to take part no, no, I, th I think I, th I think we. I think um, the committee is always seeking to move forward on a consensual basis. So I think we've already agreed to write to a range of registered social landlords. We will write to the Scottish Government asking them whether it will take the petitioners' concerns into account um, as part of the current FO FOI Scotland Act consultation and the forthcoming Scottish Housing Charter consultation and. I would suggest, with the committee's agreement, that we also write to the petitioner, encouraging them to engage with the Scottish Government's consultation and the forthcoming Scottish Housing Charter yeah. consultation. Agreed. Agreed. Any other actions at this stage? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we now move on to consideration of our second petition, and can I welcome Nigel Don, MSP? Uh, the second petition is to consider an update regarding PE1236 by Jill Fotheringham on the A90, A937 safety improvements. Attached to the paper for this item is an update from Transport Scotland announcing that Nestran's access to Lawrence Kirk's study is now complete. It states that the preferred option arising from the study is an update, sorry, an upgrade rather, of the A90, A937 South Junction to a grade separated junction. Transport Scotland concludes the letter by stating that it will now work with its partners to progress this work further, including discussions around funding. Can I invite comments from members? Alex. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, I remember in the summer of 2004 being a signatory to petition uh, 778, which was the predecessor uh, petition to this one. It was subsequently closed uh, in March 2005 after the government gave a, a series of undertakings uh, about safety improvements uh, at this junction, uh, which included at the time speed limits of 50 miles per hour, the, inclusion, the installation of speed cameras, and an expectation by the petitioner and others that this would progress the improvement to the junction uh, at some point. It became subsequently clear that the speed cameras and the speed limits were all there was going to be. Uh, and the argument has been rehearsed on a number of occasions that since their installation there have been no serious accidents. Well, unfortunately, uh, in the last month there has been a further serious accident uh, at that junction. The news of the 
Nestrand's report and its recommendations has been welcomed uh, with uh, delight and enthusiasm by the campaigners uh, and people in the area. However, I'm keen to ensure that we don't make the same mistake uh, as we did back in 2005 and assume that this piece of good news means that the problem is solved. Funding still remains a serious issue and having the, the, the committee having stuck with this over a long period of time, uh, and myself as an individual for even longer, uh, I think it's important that we don't take our eye off the ball at this stage. Uh, and on the positive side, there is an opportunity for the committee to go forward, uh, stick to this issue uh, till there really is a solution in place, uh, and perhaps share and celebrate in that success when it comes. Do you any other members have any comments? In which case, can I invite Nigel Don? Yeah, th thank you very much, convener. Um, this is dear to my heart, being right in the middle of my constituency. Uh, I'm grateful to Alex Johnson for his previous comments. This has been taken forward on a cross-party basis, and clearly I hope we continue to do so. Um, there's a, a very real sense in which the consultant's report tells us nothing we didn't already know, because anybody who lives anywhere near there needs, we, knows we need a great separated junction. Um, and indeed, the current arrangement of, of a speed limit and, and uh, traffic uh, speeding cameras was actually discounted in the consultation as the first option, which wasn't regarded as good enough before they even consulted. Um, it's also clear that Transport Scotland will not give permission for any substantial planning application anywhere near there until there is a grade separated junction. Um, so it does have to be done, and I think we now understand that. I'm entirely with Alex Johnson. I would very much welcome it if the committee would keep this open, not least because if we read the words, Jill Fotherings um, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to improve safety measures on the A90, by constructing a grade separated junction. And I'm personally, I'm not gonna be happy until we've actually got it constructed. Members will recognize that won't be months, that will take years, even if there's a positive move immediately. So I would be grateful if the committee would keep this open, please. I don't think the committee needs to do anything else. I think uh, the relevant bodies, Transport Scotland in particular, and Aberdeenshire Council know that progress needs to be made. And that's all I would ask the committee to do, please. Okay, are we agreed that we wish to keep the petition open? Yeah. Do you have a further comment you yeah, wish to make, Dave? Generally, um, could, could I particularly thank Nigel Don for all the work he's done on this. I know in my previous life in the Petitions Committee, he was an honorary member of the committee. He was there so often supporting this petition. It's a very good petition, and I would certainly support keeping it open. Okay. Right. In that case, we agree to keep the petition open. Um, that concludes um, this agenda item. I now move this meeting into private, as previously agreed. Thank you. <laughs>